All right, chapter one, the first humans. Um, on page 18, I had you read the page about Lewis B. and Mary Nicole Leakey. And the significance of that is that they discovered the oldest human remains in East Africa, specifically in the Old Duvai Gorge. And the Old Duvai Gorge, if you look at the map on page 18, it is near Lake Victoria in South Central Africa. And up to this point, this was the oldest human being um, or human-like remains that were found. Um, however, things, older things have been found as well. Um, in Ethiopia, they found human remains that were 154 to 160,000 years old. Um, they found a hand axe in Kenya just last September that was anywhere from um, 1.5 to 1.8 million years old. And so this seems to be the area where they have discovered things that, that lead us to believe that East Africa is the beginnings of human beings. All right, so we're going to talk about some prehistoric times. And for you to understand when I mean prehistoric or we talk about prehistory, it is really the time before written records were actually kept and before writing was actually developed. So when we talk about prehistoric times, it's before writing. I am a big fan of the Far Side cartoons, and so this one kind of fits with the prehistory idea. It says, of course, prehistoric neighborhoods always had that one family whose front yard was strewn with old mammoth remains. So, of course, equating it to modern day homes that have a lot of junk in their yards. All right, so if we don't have writing, how do we discover what life was like hundreds, thousands, millions of years ago? Well, we use things like science, and in particular, archaeology, anthropology, um, geology, um, botany, zoology, all those kinds of things. So, archaeology is the study of past societies. Um, based on what they left behind. When you do that, we use artifacts. So we're talking about anything that's man-made, a bowl, a knife, a weapon, anything that would be used that is man-made. Anthropology is a study of human life and culture. And knowing that, because we study human life, we're dealing with live you know, human beings and animals, plants, and so if they leave an impression or a remnant um, in the Earth's crust, those are fossils. So anthropologists tend to use those. Um, they can use artifacts, but they're more into um, the human life and how that's changed versus how a weapon has changed. So again, another Far Side cartoon is anthropologists, anthropologists, and you can see that this primitive group of people um, is going to be studied by anthropologists, and so they're putting away all their technology, their VCRs, their television and lamps and so forth because apparently they think they don't have them. All right, as I mentioned, some other use, useful scientists are zoologists studying animals, geologists studying rocks and soil, and botanists, of course, studying plants. So between those five scientists, we can get a pretty accurate idea of what life was like. Technology has played a huge role in this, and this just shows you right down here how they have found a skeleton, a skull in particular here, and based on um, what they, where they can see as far as wear and tear, they then put skin back on it and typical, you know, muscle, fat, whatever it looks like it had, and then hair, and get a pretty good idea of what they believe this guy looked like. And this is just an example of what they use with the remains of an explorer by the name of Copernicus. But we can do that with just about anything. So technology really has helped us figure out and put the pieces of the puzzle together from the past. All right, so how do we date those artifacts and fossils? Um, the first thing and the most common thing is by using radiocarbon dating, the C14 that's found in all living things. C14 stops being produced once something dies, and the half-life is determined. We know the exact length of the half-life. So in other words, if something dies now, how long, how many years will half of that carbon exist? 
So if something, you know, is so many thousands of years old, they can determine that how much carbon's in it and how old it is. You can see the half-life chart on page 20, so that can kind of give you an idea how old things can be. Because C14 is no longer measurable after 50,000 years, you have to have other methods of dating. So the next one dates things up to 200,000 years old, and that's called thermoluminescence dating. And this measures the light that is around an object that they find in the soil, and that's due to electrons that are trapped there, and so they can determine it based on that. We also can use DNA sampling. We can use analysis of hair, plant tissues, blood, anything that we can find. Of course, they can do that with as well as DNA for humans. We're going to talk about the evolution of human beings. And again, this is just a view from the textbook, from history standpoint, um, not creation as other people or religious people may believe in. So it's just information. It doesn't mean you have to believe in this. So we're going to talk about how human beings evolved. The first group of people were called the hominids. And the hominids were upright. They walked upright and they made very simple tools. The first type was called Australopithecines, and these were southern apes, and they are the earliest group of people that were human-like. Again, I have a far side cartoon that says primitive spelling bees, cave, C-A-V-E, cave. The next guy in line says, oh sure, I'll probably get Australopithecus. Obviously making fun at how difficult this particular word is. All right, this group of hominids existed three to four million years ago, discovered by Donald Johansson, so you need to know him, so he's highlighted pink. Um, it was discovered mostly in Africa, in south and east part of Africa. And they also discovered another type of hominid there, the Kenyan, Kenyanthropus. And that was, of course, found in Kenya, three and a half million years old. Um, the hominids, human-like, but still very animal-like. And you can kind of see similarities, yet very, very primitive. Not necessarily a good-looking dude. The next phase was the Homo erectus. And Homo erectus is Latin, meaning upright human being. These people existed one and a half million years ago, and what differentiated them from the hominids is their use of large and more varied tools. They also were the first group of people to learn to use fire, and so that was obviously much more um, intellectual than previous groups. And these people migrated from Africa to Europe and to Asia. And page 22 shows you a map of the migration, and so you can look at that and you can see that um, North America and South America are probably the newest, quote unquote, newest um, areas where humans migrated to. This picture here just gives you a good example of what we believe the Homo erectus to look like. Um, you can see very caveman-ish, um, wide, broad faces, the big eyebrow ridges, hairy, um, little or short neck, big jaws, all those things that we associate with cavemen. The next group are Homo sapiens, and this is considered to be wise human being, and they existed 250,000 years ago, and there were two subgroups. The first one are Neanderthals, and again, they lived in Europe mostly, and also the Middle East between 30,000 and 10,000 BC. The reason why they're called Neanderthals is because they were originally located near the Neander Valley in Germany. And so that's highlighted green, so we will be labeling that on our map. And again, they were found in East um, or Southwest Asia and Europe. They were the first human beings to bury their dead. What that says about them is that they probably believe in an afterlife of some sort. And so they were the first ones to carefully do that. And they made clothes. And they needed to because they lived in cooler climates like Germany where they needed to make clothes from animal skins. All right, what did they look like? They had very powerful builds, short and stocky. Um, they had heavy jaws, which means it's just very wide. You can look at this picture here and see very wide jaws because they had to eat meat raw. Thick eyebrow bridges, you can, or ridges, you can see right here, much more of a bigger pronounced ridge than what we have in this modern skull. Much larger noses, you can see the holes are much larger, 
probably needed to use their sense of smell more than we do, and they just looked like the typical caveman. The Homo sapiens sapiens just means wise, wise human beings. And again, those were just much more intelligent based on the things that they created in life that they lived. Um, they are also called the Cro-Magnon, found in Africa between 150 and 200,000 years ago. They are the first group of people that we believe are more anatomically similar to what we look like today. And they migrated out of Africa about 100,000 years ago. They had much better tools and weapons than previous groups of people. They could not write, but they were um, artists. And they drew a lot of very primitive drawings, of course, of, of what life was like. So we learned a lot from the artwork. They also had a little bit of jewelry from ivory. And that's because, of course, they're in Africa or painted pebbles. And they were first to create a flute. And it basically looks like what I would consider to be um, a recorder that you use probably in third, fourth, fifth grade in elementary music. And it just has holes in it. So first flutes created by the Homo sapiens sapiens. All right, so the spread of Homo sapiens sapiens, which replaced all the Neanderthals by 30,000 BC, this took tens of thousands of years to move around the world. And we believe all humans belong to that same subgroup of human beings. And if you look at the map on, on page 22, you can see the time frame that we're talking here. So we believe that people lived um, in Africa 150 to 200,000 years ago, then in the Middle East 100,000 years ago, and then they went to Australia 50,000 years ago, up to Europe 40,000 years ago, to I would consider Eastern Asia, across the land bridge, um, to Alaska 15,000 years ago, south down to Canada and North America 12,000 years ago, and then south, South Africa 10,000 years ago. So you can see how different time periods and how long it actually took to go from Africa to all of the continents that humans lived on today. Okay, in the last video we ended talking about how the evolution of human beings began and then how the migration of those Homo sapiens sapiens happened throughout the world and we looked at the map on page 22. Now we're going to talk about the next section which is called the hunters and gatherers of the old stone age. First thing you need to know is the term Paleolithic. Paleolithic age refers to the earliest period of human history. It happens between two and a half million BC up to 10,000 BC. Um, paleo, the prefix of this word, is Greek meaning old stone. And because of that, you're going to notice that um, you know the paleo is the old, lithic means stone. And so that's where they get the word paleolithic. Um, I'll also refer to it as the Old Stone Age just because um, it is also called the Old Stone Age, but both are interchangeable. The Paleolithic Age was the part of human history where um, they had very simple tools that they used and again they had already migrated around the world. They hunted and gathered and so they used those basic tools for that and those tools um, mentioned on page 23 um, you can see pictures there of a hammer and a punch and other different tools where all of the tools were made out of stone. That's why they called it the Paleolithic or Old Stone Age. Once they start using different materials to make tools and weapons, um, then it's called the Iron Age, the Bronze Age, etc., etc. All right, so some of those tools, you have to realize no matter how primitive we believe these tools to be, it was still technology. And technology is that ability to make certain tools and weapons, to give them some control, to help gain food and, and so forth. Uh, and so that's what technology is. So some of them that were mentioned were hand axes, and those were, of course, used to chop wood. Choppers, however, were um, shorter handles, and all they needed to do was chop meat, almost like a, you know, a butcher knife. Spears, of course, were used to hunt and fish. 
fish hooks for fishing, needles were for sewing, but remember it was not sewing like you and I are aware of. It was sewing thick, difficult hides together. So the needles really needed to be a lot more um, durable than what we have today. Um, and scrapers, and of course that was used to scrape all the meat off of the hide and the bones, and they used every single part of those animals that they hunted. They also were the first to create razors, of course, to shave. Um, they didn't always shave because of the fact that it was a way to stay warm. And so they didn't always shave, but they also, they were invented at that point in time. Most of the people that lived during the Paleolithic time period were nomads. And I'm sure you've heard of that word before, so this is not necessarily a new vocabulary. But just to clear it up, nomads are people that do not have a permanent home. They wander place to place, and the reason why they wander is basically they're following the animals and trying to find food. So they don't move just to move for the heck of it. Um, they lived in small groups though, so when they did travel place to place, it was not individual, it was small groups of 20 to 30, and they also hunted in groups which made hunting much more efficient. Men and women really had an e equal role. Both were responsible for finding food. Women did stay closer to the home camp, if you will, um, and they did a lot more of the gathering than the hunting, and men, their job was the hunting. Because of this, there was really no um, sexual or gender differences, and so men and women were really kind of considered to be equal at this point in history. These people learned to have, had to learn how to survive, and especially when it was in colder climates. And so they learned to make primitive homes, and remember these were movable because they didn't stay in one place too long. They used wood poles or wood sticks, and of course they used animal hides. It's basically a tent is really what it was like. Um, and they would also use bones with hides to, again, kind of prop them up, do the same sort of thing. This group of people were the first to invent fire, so I have highlighted that orange. They invented fire about four million years ago, so that was a long time ago, and it was created by the Homo erectus, so not even the most intelligent, if you will, groups of people in human evolution. They used it for the basic things that you think of, warmth, light, they also used it to gather around, it brought those 20 or 30 people kind of together as a group or a community. They used it to scare animals away, especially at night. Um, they also used it in hunting to scare animals, and a lot of times they would scare them off the cliff and then go down to the bottom and pick up the meat, so it was quite convenient. Um, they also used it to cook food, which was beneficial in many ways. One, they could use it um, because, of course, it made the food taste better. It was also easier to chew and to digest, but cooked food lasted uh, much longer than um, raw food, and so therefore they could, you know, kill an animal and have that food for a much longer time period. Later on, other groups of people learned to use fire for other things, and we'll, we'll talk about that in the next section. So, how did they start this fire? Well, they used friction mostly, um, and they had a drill like wooden devices, and if you've seen Survivor or any other um, reality shows where they do that, they, they can use, um, it, it's a piece of wood that is sharpened a little bit, and then they poke it in another hole of another wooden device and kind of go back and forth with their hands, and just to create quick friction. They also could have um, iron pyrites and by creating sparks they could do that. The first fire probably was actually started accidentally by um, lightning or something along that lines, but once they learned to control fire, this is how they did it. All right, so we've created this, you know, group of people and they've had fire, they hunt, they, they're starting to gather and stay in one place for, you know, short periods of time. Unfortunately, you have the ice ages that kind of um, interfere with what you, you know what they're already knowing and existing. Um, the ice age that we're going to talk about here was between 100,000 and 8,000 BC, and it was at this point that fire, warmth, 
shelter those sorts of things were really important because they had to adapt to um, the cold ages and and use fire and stuff um, they also because of creating those tools that we mentioned or weapons um, they they created art because they had a little bit more free time and so um, on page 25 in your text it shows you a picture of some of the cave paintings in Lasco, France. The French caves are um, really one of the great examples of artwork. Now, when you look at this, it, it's not going to be the artwork that you necessarily understand and know, but what you need to understand is we're dealing with very primitive people and very primitive means for painting. Um, even though it is primitive, it is telling. It tells a lot about what life was like during this time period. So in Lasco, which is in France, southwest France, these are the paintings that you'll see. They're in caves and this elaborate um, cave system right here is where we're going to kind of take this virtual tour and so you go through and you can see this is not a smooth cave by any means but they start to paint and so you can see here this is the explorer the panel of the explorer animals right here you can see cows and so forth okay and as it goes through this little cavern you can see how far they were in to it and so very elaborate paintings for what they had as far as tools. So as they get going and go through other caverns, you can see horses, you can see um, bison, you can see um, you know, any sort of animals that they actually had. And this told us about what animals did they have for hunting, what animals did they have available for uh, you know their bones and, and skins and hides and so forth so all of these kind of tell you about what life was like all right so besides Lasco there was also caves in northern Spain at Altamira and these um, caves same thing same sort of animals because again in France and Spain, you aren't going to have a whole lot of different animals than if you had had cave paintings in Africa, for example. So here you can see Lasco, here you can see Altamira. All right, as we go through this, it talks about it, of course, in Spanish because this was in Spain. And so um, you can see some of the paintings as we go through here. sort of type of drawings, same sort of, um, you know, animals, but to me some of these paintings were clearly better than anything I could do, and they, you know, had things like fingers, twigs, some animal hairs, so they had a lot of um, artistic ability, as you can see, they interchange real pictures here with the paintings, so you can kind of see just how good these paintings are. All right, so you get to kind of see what those paintings were all about. The other thing, as I mentioned already, they're mostly of bison, um, lions, panthers, things like that were more in caves in northern Africa. But all of those oxen, bison, horses, owls, those were all animals that they had around them. Um, in those, back in those deep caves, obviously, they burned animal fat for light mostly red, yellow, and black, and those were from natural resources like minerals, animal, animal fat, sulfur, um, you know, charcoal, those kinds of things. And again, they painted with their fingertips, animal hairs, some reeds from rivers, anything that was basic. Um, there were very few human paintings at all, and if they were, they were stick figures. Humans didn't consume their life. I mean, they, they lived in groups of 20 people, but it was animals that really consumed their life. So most of it was probably for hunting, 
um, but we're not really sure. We imagine it was some sort of a ri ritual to ensure success for hunting, but we're not sure of that. It could have been that they just did it for fun or for pleasure. All right, one last joke here, practical jokes of the Paleolithic. So this poor guy got stuffed in this little animal and tied it up to a mammoth and drug him around. All right, so your map, make sure that you can label each one of these six places on your map. And we will be reviewing.